Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Thank you for joining this seminar today. It's our pleasure to, to, to host today Dr. Yang Liu, uh, who is uh, currently an assistant professor at mechanical engineering, of mechanical engineering at the City College of New York. Um, Dr. Liu was an assistant professor at East Carolina University and also postdoctoral post researcher in aircraft icing physics and anti uh, the Ising Technology Laboratory at the Iowa State University, where he also obtained his PhD. And his current research, he has many research interests, uh, including flow structure interactions, uh, incompressible turbulent flow, high speed multiphase interactions, uh, multiphase, fl uh, multiphase flows, and uh, heat transfer, as well as aircraft icing physics and anti the icing technologies, as well as unsteady multiphase flows uh, in energy device. So, a lot of very cool, uh, interesting stuff. Um, this, uh, the, the research by Dr. Liu, um, as I said, has been published in many, uh, many uh, papers and also he received uh, several awards, uh, recently uh, the CET Outstanding Faculty Research Award. Uh, so without um, any further ado, I'd like to leave the floor to Dr. Liu. I'll just like to remind everyone whether we have uh, some time at the end of, uh, of the presentation for, for questions. So you can either switch on your microphone or just write in the chat. So again, uh, Dr. Liu, the floor is yours. All right, thank you for the introduction. And uh, uh, it's my honor um, to give this presentation today. Um, I know it's late in China. So I hope uh, during my presentation, uh, I can keep you guys awake all the, all the way to the end. Anyway, all right, so let me get started. So um, today I want to talk about uh, my uh, research uh, about the multi scale, uh, multi scale physics in different thermal flow phenomena. Uh, to begin with, actually, I want to first uh, introduce you my current uh, uh, university, which is the City College of New York. So as you can see in this slide on the left side, here uh, we have some very beautiful and classic buildings. And uh, uh, the City College of New York is located in Manhattan, New York, uh, which is a uh, center of uh, culture, financial, media, and enter entertainment of the world. And it is the uh, uh, largest metropolitan uh, area in the world as well. And uh, the City College of New York actually is a founding institute of the City University of New York, which is the largest urban university system in the United States, uh, which has 25 campuses. And uh, I also want to mention here, uh, the City College of New York actually is the first free public institute for higher education in the United States, uh, which is uh, uh, designed to serve people from diverse groups. So, um, and uh, I do want to mention that actually our neighbor here is uh, Columbia University, uh, which serve for rich people. So this is the difference between our college and uh, Columbia University. And uh, uh, with that, um, we actually have very uh, exceptional alumni uh, from our uh, college. Uh, so far, we have uh, 11, Nobel awardees um, among our uh, alumni in the City College of New York and the uh, uh, Secretary of the State and also the US uh, Supreme Court uh, Justice and many others. So this is about the City College of New York. And uh, here I want to mention again, we have very beautiful buildings around our campus. However, the School of Engineering building is actually behind this beautiful classical uh, building structure uh, behind that. So this is the Grove School of Engineering. And uh, just like many other university, this, uh, the engineering building is always the, the, the most ugly building uh, uh, around the campus. But anyway, so this is uh, uh, about the city college. So about my research, so um, all right. First, I want to start with my research uh, portfolio. Um, basically, my research includes two parts. The first part is about uh, the development 
and the implementation of advanced thermal flow diagnostic techniques. And here, this is a list of the techniques that I have used, I have developed in the past many years. So with all these techniques, then we can do a lot of fundamental studies and applied research uh, for the different multi-flow and heat transfer uh, problems. And uh, here is a list of the research topics that I have worked on and I am currently working on and I plan to work in the future. Um, with that, um, in today's seminar, I want to first talk about uh, aircraft icing, which is actually my uh, PhD and postdoc work in the previous years. Um, all right. Uh, Kai, or uh, I'm, I'm not sure why there is a red line. Yeah, I think I think someone just uh, just this by mistake. So if anyone uh, just wrote this uh, sketch this uh, red line, please uh, can you delete? Sometimes it happens if people like attend on on a tablet or. No problem. Or I yeah, I can continue. No problem. Yeah, sorry about that. All right. <laughs> okay. So now come back to the seminar um, for aircraft icing. This is the video showing you how ice accumulate on this aircraft during flight. You can see on the wings and other outer surface, the ice started to build up. And uh, actually in this process, it is a very complex multi-phase uh, flow and heat transfer problem. There is an unsteady uh, phase change heat transfer. There is a boundary layer, uh, turbulent flow and the ice roughness interactions. And there is interfacial dynamics in the surface water and ice transport. So another side is waste ice creation. We need to figure out some methods to prevent or mitigate those ice creation. Then that is about the different anti-deicing technologies, which I will uh, talk about uh, briefly in the seminar later. So now let's first focus on the icing physics on aircraft. So for aircraft icing, the reason we need to study this topic is uh, when ice build up on aircraft, it is a severe problem. It can not only increase fuel consumptions, and more importantly, it can cause flight accidents. As you can see on the right side, there are many icing related flight accidents happened in the past years. And uh, also the removal of the ice layers from aircraft is expensive. So as you can see, um, I listed here, the one-time removal of ice accumulation from a commercial business jet can be up to $10,000, which is a big cost. And also the ice creation can cause flight delays. So for example, uh, the airlines in the New York City actually was canceled, were canceled nearly 900 flights uh, early this year. So that is a big issue. So we need to solve the icing problems for uh, the, uh, both the safety reason and operational issues, okay. So for aircraft icing, here is a zooming of the uh, detailed water impact, transport and ice creation on the wing. So with that, actually during this process, we need to deal with how the water impinge and transport over the surface what are the heat transfer mechanisms that determine the ice creation rate and the ice shapes? So these are the problems we have. So with that, these are the research questions we need to answer. What are the heat transfer mechanisms? How does impinge water mass transport and freeze driven by the boundary layer airflow? So with these two research questions in mind, we want to uh, first solve the first one this unsteady heat transfer during the icing process on aircraft. So with that, the first step is I establish this heat transfer model during the unsteady heat transfer. So with that, we need to itemize each heat transfer, each energy terms in this um, energy balance model and along with the mass transfer model, then we can develop all these energy equations and eventually we can derive the equation to quantify 
the convective heat transfer coefficient during the icing process, during the uh, unsteady icing process. So, and we found that actually this uh, convective heat transfer coefficient is a function of the temperature change over the surface. So with that, actually we can use our high-speed infrared imaging technique to map the surface temperatures and then use that information to help us quantify the heat transfer properties. So these are the uh, infrared imaging of the surface temperatures during the icing process on wing surface under the different icing conditions. So with such measurements, and then we can derive the temperature variations along the wing surface at a different uh, instance. And based on the temperature change and the heat transfer model we developed in the previous slide, and then we can characterize the heat transfer properties during the icing process. And we also found that there is a close correlation between the near surface flow and the heat transfer uh, properties based on our measurements. So this is about the heat transfer in aircraft icing. The dominant mechanism here actually is convective heat transfer. All right, so now let's move on to the second question. What is transient surface water transport and ice creation during the icing process? So to quantify these details, like we want to quantify how the water transport, how the ice accumulate. So with that, um, we developed this ultrasonic pulse, pulse echo technique, which can help us to quantify the thickness variations during the uh, surface water transport process. Okay, so with that, we first carry out a fundamental study. Like we want to know how the water transport over a flat plate driven by the boundary layer airflow. This is the setup. So with this technique, actually we use multiple ultrasonic transducers, and then we synchronize all those transducers, and then we convert from temporal dom domain to spatial domain, and eventually we can reconstruct the surface water waves, as you can see on this flat plate under the different wind conditions. And then we established this model, the physical model to help us analyze the data we obtained from our experiments. And then eventually we can develop this, uh, um, the, the, the correlations between the shear stress, the uh, airflow velocity, as well as the film, the water film thickness. So the, all these relationships are very important to help us uh, model the surface water transport on aircraft. Okay, so this is fundamental, but this model, all this data, this laws we developed are very useful to help us quantify and uh, um, explain those surface water transport on a wing surface in aircraft icing, okay. So in addition to that, we also use this digital image projection technique, which, which was actually developed by Dr. Kai Zhang. Um, so with this technique, we can, do the 3D, reconstruct, uh, 3D reconstruction of a surface. So here is the basic principle of that. Basically, if we want to uh, reconstruct 3D features of a deformed surface, we can view from two different perspectives. And based on the difference from the two pers perspectives, and then we can do the correlation and then get the 3D information of this structure. So, and then we applied this technique in the icing process. On the left side here, this is a reference image. There's no ice, there is no water. And on the right side here, this is, there is a surface water transport and ice creation. So when we apply the algorithms from DIP technique, and then we can reconstruct the surface water and the ice distribution. If we apply this process for the uh, for a series of the images we acquired from the icing test. And then we can reconstruct this dynamic process of the surface water transport and ice creation. So with that, we can extract many other details, like what is the thickness variation 
during the icing process and what is ice creation, what is water transport. So all this information are very helpful for us to do the icing prediction and also to help us develop more efficient anti-deicing technologies. Okay, so this is about the second uh, question we have. So basically by using the different um, advanced techniques, eventually we solved the heat transfer problem. Based on our study, we know that the convective heat transfer dominates the icing process and there is a very strong coupling between the ice roughness, the airflow, the surface water transport, and the heat transfer. And uh, also the impinged water mass actually can be transported downstream in the forms of either the surface waves or rivulets. And we developed those scaling laws between the water thickness or ice thickness uh, with the wind speed, the, 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 the shear stress, and all those parameters. And more importantly, here, actually, we can correlate our heat transfer study and this surface water transport or ice accumulation to help us develop further models to better predict the icing and uh, uh, also develop more efficient uh, anti-deicing technologies. So this is about the icing physics study. So now let's move on to the second part uh, here, which is anti-deicing technologies. So nowadays we know that the icing is a big problem. So we need to have very efficient method to remove ice. So with that, this is uh, in this slide, you can see a list of the different anti-deicing technologies, which include the mechanical method, the thermal method, the chemical method, and the uh, other are like the gas, hot gas involved methods. However, for all these traditional methods, they, they have some drawbacks. They are either too complex, too heavy, or involves too, too much energy consumption, okay? So with that in mind, we need to develop some more cost-effective method to help prevent or mitigate ice. And with that, in today's seminar, I want to talk about two strategies that we used and developed. So the first is anti-icing coatings and surfaces. And the second one is plasma-based anti-deicing technology. So first, for the anti-icing coatings, and the surfaces, um, we know that when the water impinges onto a surface, so if, uh, it, if it is just in the liquid state, it, uh, uh, it may bounce off or it may stick on the surface, okay? So to make uh, anti-icing technology or surface, we need to make sure that if it is in liquid state, it can be easily bounced off or removed, okay? So with that, actually, we selected several candidates in our studies. The first one is the superhydrophobic surface, surface, which is inspired by the lotus leaves, which has the tiny uh, nano or micro structures on the surface. The second one is called the slippery surface, which is inspired by this pitcher plant. Uh, pitcher plant um, as you can see in the animation, if the plant, if the weather is dry, this plant actually is also dry. Then those ants can climb up and down. So uh, it is rough surface. However, when the weather becomes wet, then the surface becomes super slippery. When the ants climb on the surface, they just fall into this plant and become the nutrition. So this surface basically was developed from this pitcher plant, okay? The third one, they say is a goose feather. You can see all these birds, like running in the water and then they can take off easily. Why? Because their feather is uh, hydrophobic. Water cannot stay on their feather surface. So with that, actually we used, we developed different surfaces here and then we conducted the water droplet impact test. So from all these tests, you can see when droplet impact on surface, they can be easily bounced off and break up into many tiny droplets. So that means all these surfaces can be good candidates for anti-icing uh, applications. In addition to this bio-inspired surfaces, we also use 
And uh, um, we also develop and use this PDM as soft material. So basically the use of the soft PDMS surface was inspired by this trampoline effect. So for example, if you jump on this trampoline, you can, uh, you feel fun because you, you, you can be bounced off and then back and then bounce off, okay? So this is interesting. And then we are thinking, okay? So what if a droplet impinge onto a similar surface like here? What if they can be easily bounced off and not stay on the surface? So with that in mind, we developed the soft PDMS surface. And then we conducted the, the, the droplet impact uh, test. So as you can see in this slide, uh, let's wait for a second to see how the droplet impact on these two different surfaces. So as you can see in the bottom here, this is droplet impact onto the soft material. So when it impact, it can be bounced off and then break into many tiny droplets, as you can see here, which is very different from the phenomena of a droplet impacting on a solid surface. So with that, we assume that the soft material is a very good, very promising method to mitigate ice creation, okay? So these are the background and some introdu uh, introductions and some preliminary droplet impact test for all these surfaces. And in this study, we actually conducted the icing test for all these different coatings and surfaces. We applied these surfaces on a wind model and we conducted the icing test in a icing research wind tunnel. So with that, we can say, we can compare the anti-icing performances of all these different coatings and surfaces. So in this slide, this is the icing process on the baseline surface, which is a hydrophilic surface and the slippery surface and the superhydrophobic surface. So if you compare the three, simply the use of these two specialized surfaces can mitigate icing. There is very little ice creation in the downstream. However, you can also notice that around the leading edge, basically there are always ice creation, which make all these surfaces not effective at all. And uh, um, I also want to mention that actually for the superhydrophobic surface, if we observe at the leading edge here, when the droplet impact on the surface around this leading edge, those droplets can actually penetrate into those microstructures of the surface and then freeze. So the ice and those structures are interlocked in on the surface, which make it even harder to remove. So these are the uh, some drawbacks of those surfaces. Okay. We also did the icing test for the soft materials, as you can see here. We use the PDMS surface with different shear modulars, different softness actually. So from this comparison, we can also see similar uh, results. In the downstream, much less ice. However, around the leading edge, leading edge there is always ice creation. So this is a big issue for all these surfaces. Okay? So currently there is no perfect anti-icing coatings or surfaces that can uh, complete, completely prevent ice creation. Okay, it can mitigate ice creation in downstream, but around the leading edge, it's, it's not working perfectly. Okay, so with that, I want to uh, give a conclusion about this study. The use of all those anti-icing surfaces has some beneficial effects. Okay, they can bounce off some of the impinging water mass. And also there is a very small capillary force over the surface, which which indicates a much faster water run back over the surfaces. And also for all those anti-icing coatings and surfaces, the ice adhesion strengths would be much smaller, which can help the removal of the accu uh, accumulated ice layers. So these are the benefits. However, there are also challenges here. Ice can always form around the leading edge of the airfoil in the vicinity of the stagnation line. Okay. because in that region, the shear stress becomes very small, which cannot 
drive the water mass or ice particles away, okay? And also for the superhydrophobic uh, surface, the droplets can penetrate into the surface textures, which makes the freezing even more solid, okay? And uh, further uh, making this problem uh, worse is uh, water collection efficiency actually is maximum at the stagnation point, okay? So with that, we need to figure out some other methods to help mitigate the ice creation. So now let's move on to the second one, the plasma-based anti-deicing technology. So for this part, um, I want to first give a very brief introduction about dielectric barrier discharge plasma. So this is a DBD plasma. I think many of you are familiar with this technology because it has been widely used for flow control. As you can see on the right side, it can suppress flow separation. It's, uh, it can delay separation, okay? So um, for this plasma actuation, basically there is induced flow along the surface, okay? So they say the DBD plasma, but in this part, we also found that along with the induced flow, along with uh, the, the, the generate uh, kinetic energy, actually there is also a thermal energy generated during plasma actuation. As you can see here, this is the temperature, this is inf infrared measurements during the plasma actuation. So with that, we developed all these theories and, and we found that, okay, there is actually a very strong thermal effects during DBD plasma actuation. Then why not we just use these thermal effects for, uh, to mitigate ice creation? So in that case, when we apply the DBD plasma actuators on the wing leading edge, it can not only be used for flow control, it can also be used for icing control. So with that in mind, we put, we developed all these plasma actuators on this wing surface. And uh, in this video here, you can see how the uh, plasma changes, how the, those purple glow are, are, are plasmas. So how those plasma varies during the water impingement and the transport and the ice creation. So with that, we did this uh, preliminary test. We compare the icing phenomena with plasma on and off under the same condition. So clearly you can see here, when we turn on the plasma, no ice at all. So this is a very good method to help us mitigate ice creation or prevent ice creation, okay? So as long as you have sufficient power input to this plasma actuator, you can prevent the ice creation, which is uh, very good for us. So during that test, we also did the infrared imaging. So from this temperature measurement, we can clearly see that when we turn on the plasma, actually the entire surface is well above the freezing temperature. So that is why there is no ice creation at all. So this is a plasma-based technique. However, you may ask, for the plasma method, we need to input power, but for the conventional heating method, surface heating method, we also need to input power. So which one is better? So in this study, we compared these two different methods for the same wing model, one side plasma, the other side surface heating film, okay? And then we conducted the icing test in the icing research wind tunnel. So by comparing the two with the same power input, you can clearly see that this plasma method has a better performance. And here, this is the reason why the plasma method is better, okay? So when we compare the DBD plasma and the surface heating method. For the surface heating, it's just the heat basically is conducted through the surface into the impinging water mass. And then through that process, the water can be kind of uh, melt or evaporated, okay? But for plasma, when we turn on the plasma actuators, it can not only heat up the surface, but more importantly, it heat up the gas layer close to the surface. So when the droplet impinge on the surface, it will first travel through that hot gas 
and then impinge onto that hot surface. So there is a two layer heating mechanisms here. So with that, this plasma method is more effective in terms of prevent or mitigate excretion. Okay, so this is the difference between these two methods. However, um, the plasma also has some drawbacks I will mention, okay? So this is a page to conclude this DBD plasma method. It has advantages. It, it is a unique flow and icing control technique. It has very fast response time. It is easy to implement and operate. It has a very good anti dazing performance than the, than the conventional electrical surface heating method. However, during our test, we found that if we reduce the power input around the leading edge, no ice at all, it's good. However, in the downstream, we found that those run back water mass actually can rephrase in the downstream if the power is not sufficient, okay? So this is a challenge for this tech, for this technique. So the heating is not uniform over the surface and there is a potential overheating hazard and it may introduce additional surface roughness in the downstream as you can see here. So at this point, we know that for the anti-icing coatings and surfaces, there is always ice around leading edge, but for this plasma, if the power is not sufficient, there might be ice in downstream, okay? So, and uh, these are the two methods, a comparison of the two methods. So is there a, a way that we can uh, have a perfect performance of anti-deicing technology, okay? So with these two, some of you may, may, may have the idea Actually, what if we compare, what if we combine these two technologies, okay? So we apply the coating and then we apply this plasma around the leading edge. So if we do that, basically we have a combination of these two. We can not only uh, eliminate the excretion around this leading edge, but also the downstream excretion, okay? So by doing that here, the third one, this is a combination of these two methods. This is a hybrid method. We have plasma in the leading edge, we have coating in downstream, and eventually we can achieve this completely ice-free performance. And then if we compare this method to other technologies, we can find that by using this hybrid method, we can achieve like 95% uh, power saving for the same ice-free performance, which is very significant. Okay. So to this point, basically, we develop different techniques and eventually we have this hybrid method which can help us maximize the anti-deicing uh, efficiency. Okay. So this is about the anti-deicing technology studies. All right. So at this point, I want to move on to another topic uh, which is done in my previous years. So, um, cause I have a personal interest in shock waves and blast waves, okay? And uh, this is uh, inspired in many animations and in, in other movies, actually. So with that, I have some research interest here. Like I want to know how the shock or blast interact with different droplets and how the shock or blast interact with different surfaces and what are the combination of those very complex phenomena. With that in mind, in the past few years, I developed this blast simulator. So with this blast simulator, basically we have a driver section, we have a driven section. So in the driver section, we can input the, those high pressure gas as the pressure reaches the rupture pressure of this uh, uh, membrane, uh, which, which is used to separate the driver section and the driven section, and then a blast can be generated through this test section. And then this blast can be eliminated in this blast absorber or eliminator here. So there might be some minor uh, shock reflections during this process. So this is how this blast wave simulator works. So with this facility, then we conducted the high speed shearing image and we want to visualize the shock waves and blast waves generated 
in this facility. So with that, here you can see the shock waves generated in this facility. And we use high-speed uh, layering imaging technique uh, so that we can visualize those shock waves under the different burst pressures. In the meantime, we also conducted the pressure measurements, ultra-fast pressure sensing during this whole process under the, the, the various conditions. And eventually, we see that there is a linear correlation between the burst pressure and the shock front velocity. And also there is a relationship between this peak overpressure during this blast generation and the membrane thickness that we used in this facility. So with all this data and visualization, we can conclude that this facility can allow us to, to generate the blast and shock waves in the lab condition and it can reproduce the physics and waveforms of real explosions, which is very useful for us to carry out other research activities. So, so now with this facility and with the good performance of this facility, we are interested in how those shock or blast interact with airfoils. So as you can see on the left here, there are some uh, UAV used for blast detection. And those devices can be easily damaged if they encounter a blast. So in this study, we want, we want to study how the shock or blast would uh, 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 degrade the aerodynamic performance of a wing model here. Okay. So with that, we conducted the high-speed Schlieren imaging, and also uh, we conducted the force measurements. So from our studies, we found that there is a very intense cylindrical wave reflection at the leading edge, and there are developments of the secondary shock waves and the trailing edge cylindrical waves during this process. Along with the force measurements, we also found that there is a linear dependency between the lift force and the peak overpressure during for, uh, in that blast. However, for the drag, there is very weak dependency here. So this is about the interaction um, between the blast and this airfoil surface, okay? So now we want to develop a method to mitigate the shock effects. So now I want to show this image once again. So in this image, this is the surface, the soft PDMS surface that we use for mitigate icing because in this one, when, when the water impinges on the surface, they can be like uh, uh, bounced off easily. However, for such soft material, they can also absorb those impact energy and dissipate those energy. So here in this study, we again utilize this surface on the wing surfaces. Basically, we applied this PDMS surface on this wing, we model, and then when the uh, shock wave impact on the surface, basically we have multi layers of the surface. So these multi layers could either reflect or absorb or dissipate the impact energy. So now here is a comparison of these two models with and without the soft material. So uh, it is clearly observed that the soft surface can delay and mitigate the blast reflection at the leading edge, the kinetic energy can be effectively dissipated by the soft material. And this is still an ongoing project. Okay, so this is about uh, my prior studies on the shock and the blast and the interaction with other structures and also the mitigation techniques. So currently I have another interest uh, on the flow dynamics and heat transfer in 3D printing. So as you can see in this slide, nowadays we have many different 3D printing technologies. So with all these technologies, actually, they are dependent on the phase change of materials. So during the 3D printing process, there is very complex multi-phase flow and heat transfer. So in my research, my interest includes two parts one is inkjet based 3D printing. And uh, yeah, so uh, one is bider jetting based inkjet 3D printing, and the other is inkjetting 3D printing. So for the bider jetting, basically, 
those glue droplets or better droplets will be jetted on powder surface. And then those particles will be combined and then layer by layer to achieve the 3D printing. But for the ink jetting, this, the colloidal droplets will be uh, jetted onto a solid surface. And then through evaporation, those solid particles would be left on surface. And then layer by layer, the 3D objects can be created. For both of these two techniques, there are some drawbacks. As you can see, due to the complex interaction between the job and the powders, there might be some ejection of the particles and the tunneling or cratering of the surface, which can create defects in the 3D printing. And for this inkjetting method, due to the flow motions or surface deformations of the liquid droplet, actually there might be some ununiform uh, deposition, which could create uh, defects in the printing process. So in my study, I want to understand the fundamental thermal flow physics in this printing process. And we want to develop some method to improve the quality and the resolution of these different methods. So now let's first look at this spider jetting method. So for this spider jetting method, we want to study the effects of the spider liquid properties on the impacting dynamics. And also we want to quantify the transient details during the spider job and the particle interactions. So with that, here, here is a test rig we developed in the lab. Basically we use high-speed camera to capture the instant details during the job hit, the spider job impact on powder surface. And here, these are the high-speed images of the spider job's impact on the different powder surfaces under the different impact conditions. So with all these images, and then we can do the pulse image processing, and then we can extract many important details like the ejection height, the ejection weight of those powder particles. So with all this information, then we can characterize the dynamics during this very complex interaction, which can help us determine the optimized parameters for such 3D printing technology. And now the question is, uh, with the high-speed imaging, we can visualize those process. However, we cannot quantify those details. So is there a way to help us quantify those transient details during this interaction? So now we come up with DIP technique, which we used for the icing study. However, for this DIP technique, there are some limitations. There are very restrict requirements in the camera projector alignment, and there is a limited spatial resolution due to the spacing settings in those patterns in this technique. And the post-processing speed is very slow. So these are the limitations of, the, of this technique. So in this study, we developed this random dot projection imaging technique in which we, instead of projecting those uh, regular grid or fringe patterns, we project this uh, we generate and project this random dot pattern onto the surface. And then we have these benefits. It provides flexibility in camera projector alignment, and we can control the dot density to achieve much better spatial resolution, and the processing speed would be much faster. So with that, now we can reconstruct the very, uh, very complex and transient droplet particle interactions during this process. So this is uh, another work that I have done uh, for this research topic. So with that, basically in the spider job impact process, uh, we, we can reconstruct the complete process, which include initial contact, spreading, drainage, receding, rebounding for some cases, and also the final primitive formation of the particle uh, combinations, okay? And also through this study, we can characterize the powder ejection dynamics and uh, we can correlate all those different parameters to help us optimize this process, okay? So this is for the binder jetting process. The second 3D printing technique, which is ink jetting um, technique, 
in this process, as I mentioned, there is a flow dynamics, there is a liquid deformations, which can create defects in the printing process, as you can see here. So when the droplet impact on surface, due to the deformation and the internal flow, eventually those particles would be uneven on the surface, which can create defect. So those flow dynamics uh, actually is similar to the droplet impact on solid surface, as you can see here, how those dynamics could uh, redistribute those particles. So in my uh, research lab, we are trying to answer these questions. How can we control the droplet spreading cap size to improve the printing resolution? And how can we express those unwanted internal flow to kind of, uh, to, uh, to prevent those uneven deposit uh, distribution? So with that in mind, actually um, the icing problem, okay? In my PhD and postdoc work reminded me something. So in aircraft icing, we know that when supercooled droplets impinge on the surface, they can freeze instantly and then form ice shapes. So now, Let's say, why not we just use this instant freezing mechanism in 3D printing so that when the job impinge, it can freeze instantly. So there is no big, no spreading, there is no internal flow, okay? So with that, we developed this freezing-based inkjet 3D printing concept. So in which the supercooled job with those particles would impact and freeze instantly upon impact. So in that case, we can eliminate all those surface deformations and the internal flow to generate a very uniform deposit distribution. So this is the technique we recently developed. And this is also an ongoing project in my research lab. Okay, so this is about the uh, 3D printing. And here, I also want to broadcast uh, a special issue that I, I I, I work as a guest editor. So if any of you are interested to submit a paper about liquid characteristics and behaviors in 3D printing, please reach out to me. And this is a, a free open access, uh, open access journal. So uh, if, I, if you receive my invitation, basically it is free of charge for publication. So uh, this is just an advertisement here, okay. So now continue in my research seminar. Um, during my past years, I have also conducted many interdisciplinary research projects. One example here is uh, sand wave or ripple formation and evolution in deserts. So as you can see in this video, in the desert, there are many such sand waves or, 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 or ripples formed, okay? And actually in the formation process, there is a very complex turbulent boundary layer and the surface interactions and those sediment uh, uh, process. So with that, actually, we want to know the evolutionary particulars of the sand bed form in both the spatial and temporal scales. And also we want to know the interactions between the dynamically involving sand waves or ripples and the turbulent boundary layer airflow. So with that, Basically, we conducted this DIP technique again to quantify the surface sand wave and the sand ripple um, uh, morphology. And in the meantime, so here, this is a test result. Basically, we can reconstruct the dynamic formation and development of the sand waves driven by the uh, turbulent boundary layer flow. And in the meantime, we conducted the PIV and PTV measurements. So in which we can quantify the boundary layer airflow, the flow structures, you can see the periodical uh, velocities along with the development of the sand wave. So by correlating the surface morphology and the boundary layer flow structures, and eventually we have this uh, uh, final correlation results, which can help us divide this, uh, this very complex process into five stages as listed here. So this is very important for us to better understand the fundamentals in this dynamic process. Okay, so this is uh, one example of the inter interdisciplinary research project. 
And another one that I want to share today is uh, uh, related to a biomedical study, which is a characterization of the fruit fly heartbeat parameters. So in this project, actually we want to study the effects of a Western diet, like the burgers, fries, which has very uh, high sugar, fat, and salt. We want to know how this food, how this diet pattern would affect the heart functions of human. Okay, and also we want to examine whether exercise could mitigate the effects of this Western diet uh, diet pattern. So in this study, we use fruit fly as our genetic model because it's cheap and uh, it reproduces very fast. We can have four generations in one month. So with this fruit fly and with this research purpose, we use our high-speed imaging technique, high-speed microscopic imaging technique so that we can visualize the heartbeat in this fruit fly. So as you can see here, this is the heart tube of this fruit fly under the microscopy. And then we can virilize the heartbeat process in this fruit fly and ways of virilization. And then we can do the image processing and signal processing. And eventually we can extract the, the various heartbeat parameters. And eventually we compare the different test groups. As you can see here, CD is controlled group with no Western diet and CDE here, this is a controlled group plus exercise. And the WD here, this is Western diet, which you can see it has a big effect on the heart function, very negative effect. However, if you have some exercise there, this effect can be slightly mitigated. So we compared the performance of these four groups under the, uh, for the different uh, parameters. And we can conclude that the Western diet do have a big effect. However, the exercise, the exercise could actually mitigate this effect. All right, so this is about this research. And to summarize, this is a slide showing my expertise in the different uh, thermal flow diagnostic techniques. And on the right side, a list of the research topics that I have worked on so far. So this is about my, uh, my research. And uh, at last, I want to uh, ac acknowledge all my previous colleagues and also the current students and collaborators and both the City College of New York and my previous University of uh, East Carolina University. And uh, I will also want to thank all my uh, uh, funding agencies here, uh, which helped me conduct all these research projects. With that, uh, at last, I want to introduce my current lab at the City College of New York. So currently, my lab is a house in the Grove uh, Building of Engineering, so in which we have this large-scale shock tunnel facility, which can generate Mach number up to six, uh, so which is a very unique facility in the US. Uh, so if any of you are interested to, to uh, work with me, please reach out to me. And in the meantime, we have this large scale environmental boundary layer wind tunnel facility, which can help do many energy related and uh, environment related research projects. So with that, I want to conclude my seminar today. Um, so this is actually uh, a video of the uh, a pig in a smoke tunnel. So you can see how pig fly from this uh, very fun video. So um, with that, I want to conclude and thank you all for your time. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Uh, dear Wenyi, I think you, you didn't unmute yourself. Uh, sorry, I cannot hear you.
So, uh, essentially, Giovanni, so uh, uh, I, I don't know if it's not polite, but like uh, both Yang and me kind of hear you. So maybe I can just take over a job and ask audience to ask questions. Like, suppose you are not mine. Okay, so uh, thanks, Yang, for this like uh, very impressive like topic, and and uh, I saw like you investigate many many topics, and uh, it's it's so creative. Like you spend so much like thinking on like so many topics. It's uh, really impressive. Uh, uh, is anyone like have any like questions for uh, Dr. Yang? Uh, sorry, Dr. Liu. Uh, you can just open your mic, or you can like left the question in the chat. Uh, hello, Professor Liu, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, this is uh, Wei Kangdu from Mercury Marine. I have a quick question. So you show some very interesting techniques about the uh, anti-icing. I'm just wondering how much will those uh, techniques affect the performance of the uh, uh, airfoil or the wing? For example, if you change the surface by using the super hydrophobic uh, technique or by putting a coating on the surface, Will it uh, add uh, frictional losses to the surface that will make the air for you less efficient? How much effect will this uh, have on the performance? All right, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, but uh, I, uh, I want to mention that actually many of those uh, super uh, super hydrophobic surface or other surface actually have been used for uh, drag reduction. So it's not only good for icing mitigation, actually it is also good for the uh, aerodynamics. Like it can reduce drag and keeps the lift uh, uh, the same. So uh, uh, in terms of the roughness uh, on those surfaces, actually those roughness are very small. The scale is very small. And I don't think they have a, a, a big impact on the uh, aerodynamics like uh, 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 whether or not they, they, they could introduce uh, additional significant uh, friction force. I don't think so. But uh, you are right. Uh, when people develop those coatings or surfaces, uh, definitely uh, we should keep that in mind. We need to keep uh, those surfaces effective for icing control, icing control. But in the meantime, we should not affect the aerodynamics. Thank you. Thank you very much for the answer. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, for some reason, my mic was not working. Um, okay, so any other questions? So thank you, Kai, for taking over. Uh, I, I might ask one question, if meanwhile the, the, uh, the question from the audience. So the tests that you've done for the, for the, the high scene, were like in a steady conditions, I guess, uh, from the inflow, I'll say. Um, so again, uh, in, in, in steady inflow uh, conditions. So have you tried also with like no, no state, unsteady, unstationary uh, condition like gas or any, any sort of you know, unsteady <laughs> condition? Sorry, could, could you say your sound breakouts uh, sometimes on my side, oh, so okay. I cannot. So basically, I, I suppose that uh, the tests that you have done for the uh, the high scene were in steady conditions for the inflow. Have you have you performed uh, experiments or tests for unsteady conditions, like for example during gusts or something like that? Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's a good point, actually. So uh, during the, those icing tests, yes, you are right. We try to keep the incoming flow velocity, the liquid water content, the droplet size, all those kind of uh, uh, steady state, constant during each, uh, during each icing test. But I also want to mention that actually in each icing test, those phenomena on the model, like, how the water impinge, transport, the heat transfer, all those detailed physical processes, those are unsteady process, yeah. right? So, uh, and uh, when we do a study, we want to minimize the yeah. difficulty 
Yeah, yeah, yeah I know, so, I, I know, <laughs> but that that was just my curiosity. So, it's, if you already, but tried. it's a good point. Yes, it's a good point, and uh, I think it, it's worth studying. You know, if we have a gust condition, or if, if we have a sudden change of the liquid water content, or whatever, how those would affect either the aerodynamics or the heat transfer, all those uh, parameters. Yes, I yeah. think it's a good point. Thank you. I don't see any other questions from the audience. So, uh, oh, essentially, Yang, uh, I would like to uh, ask a question, like say, um, like right now you have a, a like very impressive facility, like the, the giant shock, shock tube. So uh, how to say the, uh, Supersonic uh, flight is always a dream. Um, however, like you know, the like source of the noise is always like the limitation for people uh, develop, developing such vehicles. Like it's hard to to pass the uh, pass the like the uh, FAA like regulation because it may like influence uh, the people people in the ground a lot. So is this facility like I know it's sort of like for a blast wave. Uh, idea it, it, this this is perfect but like is this device like used to or like you plan to uh, do something like it relates to the like like the, how how the acoustics and and, and shock waves are related to each other like do you have such plan good point uh, to be honest i don't have that plan plan at this point because uh, as you can see in my seminar today i have too much on my plate and uh, so at this point, point actually, uh, in my research, I will focus on the uh, job plates focused or dust focused, like how those would uh, interact with the different, uh, like you in, in, in this shock tunnel facility. I want to study how the job plates interact with the shock wave and uh, on the different surfaces. Okay, and for the three D printing. I will study the different job plates, impact dynamics, and what is the heat transfer, the multiphase interactions. So yeah, this is uh, uh, the research project currently in my research lab. But uh, you, what you just mentioned, it is very interesting, and I hope to develop in the future. Definitely, uh, if you are interested, we can have more discussions later. Uh, probably do something together. Yes, I am interested, but at this point, I'm doing. I'm not working on that topic. Yeah, uh, uh, another question is like you use the, like the high high speed uh, Schlieren imaging, which is like I remember I look at the, like uh, Doctor uh, Swin's uh, like he actually started a company like sell the uh, Schlierens, which he use uh, optical flow to like directly calculate the uh, uh, velocity from the uh, Schlieren image. So. Uh, like in this shock tube, uh, is this like could do like Schlieren and then do the same with the measurement as well? Or like, I mean, yes. ability. Yes, actually, currently one of my students is uh, setting up a, a, a back oriented Schlieren uh, setup, mm. so which you can use to quantify the flow field. It's basically, uh, it's also uh, the basic principle is the same, the Schlieren imaging. But uh, actually, we can uh, use a grid pattern in 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 uh, process so that we can characterize the pattern changes during the blast uh, generation. So that we can not only visualize, we can also quantify the velocity field. Yes. So I think. Uh, I think I mentioned the different methods. That the BOS is one way. Like another way is the optical flow. But anyway, like uh, I can send you a e like, like maybe share the uh, the the article right by Doctor Swin, and then like we can discuss later. Like, okay, all right, yes, it will be helpful. Yeah, those. I think that's very interesting to have this kind of discussion for this seminar. So one of the purposes of this seminar is to stimulate this kind of potential collaboration. You know, so very very happy to see the, this 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 conversation. So. I would like to stop here. So we'd like to thank again Dr. Yang Liu 